welcome to the Creative Breakthrough. I am your host, Shireen Kassam, aka the Funny Brown Girl. Like I mentioned a couple weeks ago, we are starting up season three of this podcast, and I could not be more excited. We have such a great lineup of guests for you this season. We've got MSNBC's Ali Velshi. We've got Jamie Kalika from Tyler Perry's Ruthless TV show. We've got Netflix's working moms, Nelu Honda. And we've got chef Saqib Kewal, who is the chef and co-founder of the restaurant Masala E. Maze, which Times Magazine rated one of the best places to go in the world. Okay, y'all. So we have such a great lineup of guests this season. And this week, we have one other special guest. We have co-founder of Deaf Comedy Jam, Bob Sumner with us, y'all. I am just, I am blown away that Bob Sumner said yes, that he was willing to be on this podcast. I mean, I didn't give him much choice because I've been on his case since I met him a couple years ago, but the fact that he found time to share his insights with us, share his advice with us, this is going to be huge, okay? So, oh my God, I just said huge like the president did, and I did not mean to do that, so I take that back. Let's rewind. Um, this is going to be amazing. Uh, <laughs> um, please go out and vote. Please, please, please go out and vote. Okay, I don't want to waste a lot of time. I want to get right into the interview, but a couple of announcements. This week, or actually last week, last week, we started trending in Nigeria, y'all. So now we're trending in Nigeria, Zimbabwe, and Kenya. How cool is that? Plus 14 other countries. No, 15 other countries, because now we're trending in 16 countries across the world. You guys, when I started this podcast, I was nervous that just 20 people would listen to it, if even 20 people. Well, I was I was hoping for 20 because I counted all my really good friends and made them promise they would listen to it. So I got to 20. The fact that we are trending around the world in 16 countries is huge. And I thank you all. I'm so grateful to you all. To those of you who have listened every week that I put this podcast out, those of you who have shared it with your friends, those of you who have left reviews, because reviews is what really helps other people find this podcast, I cannot thank you enough. And hey, if you're listening to this podcast right now on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or even Spotify, hit that share button. Hit that share button. Send it to a friend that you think may find this episode enlightening or interesting, or share it to your social media. There's so many ways you can share it. And hey, leave a review. I ain't going to hate if you got to pause this for a hot minute and leave a review. Okay, so we're trending in Nigeria now. Second announcement, over COVID, over COVID, not that it's over yet, because um, I'm in Florida, and it, I don't think it's ever going to be over in Florida, but during the time I had off from COVID, which I still do, but um, I redesigned my entire website, and it is amazing, and I think you guys should check it out because there's some really cool things on there. So go to funnybrowngirl.com. You heard me right, funnybrowngirl.com, and you can get all the past episodes of this podcast. What's really cool, though, is there's a quiz. So if you are a new listener or you, say, missed a few episodes here and there, you can take this quiz and find the episode that's best for you. So check that out. There's also a workbook so you can accompany this podcast with a workbook to really elevate your creative journey. So check that out as well. And while you're at my website, go ahead and sign up for that email list. You know, put your, put your email in there. And every other week, I'm going to send you resources and opportunities to help you elevate your creative journey. So get on that. If you don't want to do all of that, not that that's a lot of work, but Another resource for you is to join our Facebook group. We have a really big Facebook group of creatives looking to partner with people, share their latest skit, get some ideas. So join that. You can do that two ways. You can either go to funnybrowngirl.com forward slash Facebook or go to Facebook and search Creative Breakthrough Community. Either way, you'll find us. Hit us up and we look forward to collaborating with you in that Facebook group. Okay, so those are the announcements for this week. Now, on to our special guest, Bob Sumner. I am so blessed, like I said, to have him on this podcast. For those of you who have not heard of Bob Sumner or are not aware of him, you probably do know who he is, but you just don't know what he's done. So I'm about to tell you. Bob is best known as the co-creator of HBO's Russell Simmons' Deaf Comedy Jam, a recognized force in the world of comedy and the man behind most comedy legends. With over 25 years of experience, Bob has discovered many of the top gifted comedians that have graced the stages and big screens around the world, including Kevin Hart, Bill Bellamy, Mike Epps, Dave Chappelle, Cheryl Underwood, Chris Tucker, Cedric the Entertainer, and Bernie Back. And hey, one day, my name is going to be on this list. So in a couple years, whoever's interviewing Bob Sumner and reads this list is going to say Cedric the Entertainer, Bernie Mac, and Shireen Kassam. 
Bob is the executive partner in Laugh Mob Enterprises, which has produced specials that have aired on Showtime, DirecTV, and On Demand. He's also the executive producer of Laugh Mobs, We Got Next, and Laugh Mobs Laugh Tracks. Now, just to give you guys some context on this interview, we recorded this in April of 2020, so right at the height of the COVID pandemic. We also were live streaming this interview. So if you're watching this right now on YouTube, you may see some technical glitches, some parts here and there where there's like an awkwardness or silence or distraction. That's all because of the whole live streaming thing. There was a little bit of you know, you know how it is. I ain't even going to try to explain what happened there. Um, okay. This interview or this conversation with Bob also lasted an hour and 45 minutes. I mean, it was like the best hour and 45 minutes of my life, but it did last an hour and 45 minutes. And I don't want to put all of that information out there today. Cause I want you guys to be able to take what he says and start to just think about it and how to incorporate it into your life. So we're going to probably split this episode into two episodes. So there'll be part one. And then in two weeks we'll launch part two. Cause I really want you guys to go away and take this information with you. Cause there's, there are some gems in this interview, y'all. There are some gems. Now, for those of you who have been listening to this podcast since the beginning, you know that I am in love with the American black film festival, ABFF. Um, we also mentioned in here how I met Bob. I met Bob at ABFF and we talk about how this year it's going to be in October. It actually will not be in October. It actually already happened in July. It was a virtual event this year. Um, so don't go out there trying to buy your tickets for October. But once this pandemic is over, highly, highly, highly suggest going to the American Black Film Festival. Um, that's where I met Bob Sumner. I actually met him before that at the semifinals for the Comedy Wings um, comedy special or comedy competition that was sponsored by ABFF and HBO. And he is just the most kindest, most genuine, most humble man you will ever meet. And he has just been, he has been such a rock. He's been such an inspiration for me. He, he elevated my comedy career. I mean, this, this man will, this man, I just, there's just like no words to explain what this man can do for you and what this man has done for me. I mean, he has, what he's done for my comedy career has been amazing. And so that's why I'm so excited for him to share his story and his creative advice with you guys today. So what are we waiting for? Let's get started. Welcome to the guest chair, Bob. Thanks for having me. Thank you for making time. I know, I know you're a busy man, so, and it's been a couple years since we've, we've met, so thank you. Yeah, well, it's, it's perfect timing, actually, right? <laughs> it is, exactly. So what have you been up to that, while we're in this pandemic and this coronavirus, April 2020? I've just been in my little lab right here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I've been in my little lab right here just trying to figure things out. And also, um, when I say trying to figure things out, I see that a lot of people are doing like live comedy on online and having sh vibe shows, you know, virtual shows. I have to wonder what is that? Like how <laughs> how is that really coming off because you know, it's one thing doing comedy like on like being a morning radio person and things that you have to be funny one type of way, but actually not having an audience and you trying to do stand up or whatever you want to call it like how does that resonate so mm -hmm. have you tuned in? I, that's kind of interesting have you tuned into one of those shows no i don't even know where to turn to and up because <laughs> d nice all over the place <laughs> every time i go to ig is d nice <laughs> yeah he's taken over he's capitalized <laughs> on that I more power to him that's so cool <laughs> i was thinking about doing a couple things though on online but i'm trying to I want to tweak it out and then see what everyone else do. You know, we did the uh, Laughter Through Healing event a couple of weeks ago with Jeff Comedy Jam. Yep, I saw that. That was pretty deep. Yeah. So, like, how are you? How are you using this time? Like, I know a lot of people. Some people are just like sitting around watching TV, but I know you're a hustler. So, how are you using the time? Honestly, I'm using the time like I'm twenty four seven. You know what I mean? I'm 24 seven all day. Like this is no different than how I normally operate anyway, <laughs> being yeah. honest. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm just, I be chilling and then I get into my thing when I get into my thing. You know, I've been doing a lot of um, law and order though. <laughs> <laughs> SVU? 
I mean, really, I've been doing SVU. I've been doing some CI, too. You know, criminal investigation, the way they do their thing. Law and order is big. I even been dipping in. This might be crazy because they, they had a um, they had a um, a movie on Lifetime by the Clark sisters, right? Mm -hmm. Did very well, gospel group. But I got kind of stuck on Lifetime. <laughs> those... Those lifetime Those crazy lifetime teacher, them crazy teacher, you know who did it, yeah. but still, it's like, how do they get to the approach of it? I haven't been doing that. I've been, you know, smoking a little bit <laughs> to take care of my back and watching. It's been cool. It's been cool. Yeah, I'm addicted to the Law and Order. My problem is I start watching them really late at night, and then I binge watch it till like two and three in the morning, and then I'm scared to go to sleep. I'm like, oh my God, what did I do? <laughs> Here's the trip about two two o'clock though. Like I again I'm twenty four seven. It's no telling, especially with the way it is right now, because I really don't have to be any place. But what I notice is after I watch my man um Scott Van Pelt, Sports Center S V V P, even though it's no sports going on, he has a way of entertaining. Just mm -hmm. like the late night, I'm really fouling Fallon is the one with his little kids. They're yep. cracking me up right now. <laughs> so after the news, I got a whole routine. I have different routines since I've been home. You know, you have the um, the family feud, <laughs> the family feud, <laughs> and um, Jeopardy, and 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 and, and, and uh, Wheel of Fortune. I got that part right. Then I'd be playing around between eight and eleven. Like, you got that one now on ABC, the, um, my man is locked up in, in prison, right? You got They got this joint on Tuesday night, and one of the comedians, Felonious Monk, is actually one of the inmates oh, okay. on, on the show. Um, I, I forget the name of it. I should know the name of it. My, my memory is escaping me right now. But I've been watching this joint, and... and, and I haven't gotten into the mask. I just can't seem to watch them. <laughs> you know, you got me started now because I'm just thinking about <laughs> how my days are going. But it goes back to the 11 o'clock news. It goes to Fallon. It goes to Sports Center. But somehow I get back to like Jeopardy, right? <laughs> they got a late night Jeopardy, or sometimes it's Wheel of Fortune. But I got stuck at 2 a.m. I've been watching Mannix. <laughs> Seriously. I, so, and then I go to sleep at 3, and then I wake up for prayer at, at 6.15. Wow. And, and, then I, and then I deal with my day again. It's really a trip how I've been flowing. Yeah? You just survive on three hours of sleep? Well, it's, it, it's between 3 and 5, according to where my head is um, after 11. I definitely okay. watch the news and right. then I flow into, you know, whatever that's going to be. But normally it's, I would say four, I can operate on four hours. Wow. You know? I wish I could. I'd get yeah. so much more done. <laughs> yeah. So I want to, I want to start from the beginning. How, how did your, or when did your creative journey start? My journey started as a as a kid i mean as a kid it really started as i was traveling back and forth to the apollo theater you know it's, it's funny that i'm at the apollo theater now mm -hmm. but um when i was a kid now i'm talking about four years old we would go to the apollo my parents and my brothers every wednesday almost every wednesday and wow. Sunday, we would go there. They would have the um, amateur night on Wednesday. They would have matinees on Sunday. And then after the matinee or before the matinee, normally after the matinee, we would go have dinner at one of my aunt's house up in um, Harlem. And then we would always see like the um, Motown reviews, the James Brown reviews, all these different shows would come to town and they would always have a comedian on mm -hmm. the show. It would be Moms Mabley, it would be Nipsey Russell, Slappy White, Richard Pry. it was crazy. So this was me as a little kid 
absorbing all of this that has led right. to what I'm doing now. That's you know? awesome. So were your parents really big into the arts as well? Were they creatives? Yeah. Yeah. My um my mom my mom actually she worked at um RCA Records. Okay. In New York. And my dad was like a manager of a band and stuff when I was a kid. So like it's it's really been a trip. I'm I'm talking. So you you grew up going to the Apollo, and then you you got your start at Def Jam as an assistant. How'd you move up to media mogul? Like how did you how did you hustle your way from assistant to media mogul? I don't know. I don't know. To be honest with you, honest honestly, those early days as a kid at the Apollo and then watching my parents be so into, you know, the entertainment and then my brothers, you know, it was like me getting to Def Jam, there was a whole lot in between. Right. It. There was like you were running a show, right? You were running comedy shows and jazz shows, right? Yeah. But even before that, oh, yeah? like. Yes, because <laughs> this is crazy. My documentary is going to um, really talk about the early, early years okay. because my brothers, they had a um, singing group and they would like actually practice their band. I mean, their band would be in my living room. My mom would like fry some chicken and make some potato salad. When they would take the break, I'd be sitting on the steps and they would be performing. You know what I'm saying? And then my other brother was in the singing group. It was two. It was a band and it was a singing group. So I would watch the band practice, right? right. And the, all week the band practice while the singing group was somewhere else practicing. Then they would all come together and, and put their show together and then go perform in the weekends at all different venues. Wow. All right. So I was embedded in this as a kid. And then with my mother working at RCA Records, I had all these records and I had a little clubhouse in my backyard that we called it the sucker. And it, that was because of Parliament Funkadelic had tear the roof off the sucker. <laughs> so, so that was our little place where we would hang out. We weren't in the streets unless we was playing basketball or, you know, some type of sport. But that's where it all went down. So as I went through my childhood and got to high school, I started having parties at my crib for a quarter and literally make a hundred dollars off a of quarter. So many people from Roselle Linden, it was nuts. So my whole life started there and then I went to college and got caught up in the radio. Oh yeah. You know? Right. So so the whole Def Jam thing, it was so much other things going right. on before Def Jam. So now we could catch back up. <laughs> well, you still you still kept making those moves. I guess what what do you feel like? What is innate to your personality, or what is a skill that you have that's helped you make all these moves and get to where you are? Well, one of the things is by being born around people who was already successful in entertainment business. You know, one of my uncles was the reason my parents used to go to the Apollo so much is because one of my uncles is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Oh, awesome. Uh, Tony, Tony Williams from the Platters. Okay, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. so that was already embedded in me. And then as I got into high school, um, after my mom and dad, they had separated, then divorced, my father married into the family of uh, Willie Randolph. Okay. From the New York Yankees, you know, who was around, you know, they was World Series champs and stuff. So I always was around entertainers and sports figures and things like that. And then, like I said, my brother and them, they were already doing shows with like Smokey Robinson and Cool and the Gang and all that type of stuff. So, you know, it was just embedded in me to be doing what I'm doing the way I'm doing it. I'm not the artist, but I'm the behind the scenes guy. And I, I kind of like that part of it, mm -hmm. you know? But you still have to have a, some sort of innate desire, right? Ambition, motivation, something that something that spurs you forward, something that makes your your heart say, "I want to go do this," right? Yeah. Well, my grandmama, my grandma, right? Check it out. This is my grandma right here. Okay, my grandma. That that's that's Mabel, right? 
Mabel, she was so dope. You know, she 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 instilled a lot into me. My nephew Reggie and I, like we kind of trip because she talks to us a lot even still. You know, so it was motivation. My my parents, my father, my father, my father, who I have my softball game every every year uh, dedicated to him. He was another one that was like awesome. Even though my father and mom separated when I was nine, my father never left me. Never. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's good. So things like that make me click. Yeah. So let's so let's jump forward. I know there's a lot that we skip. All right, skipped in your story, which I know there's a lot because I, I mean we do. <laughs> I know Matt, Matt and uh, Matt yeah, and I'm Jeffrey gone. are working on that documentary, right? The documentary yeah, on me. Matt and Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they were filming yes, it at yes, ABFF, awesome. right? A couple years ago. Right. Yeah. Okay. We've been, we're still a work in progress. <laughs> you know, it takes a lot to put a documentary together. Oh, I know. And your life is so full. I mean, you've got so much going on. Yeah. Yeah. So what, I guess I, I, my question was, so when you got to deaf, to deaf jam though, you started at the bottom and you made your way up. You, you kind of moved through the ranks, climbed the ladder, what do you think helped you stand apart from other people trying to make the same hustle? <laughs> you just said I started at the bottom. <laughs> well, um, I heard I read that somewhere in your not in your documentary, but somewhere well, you said you started as an assistant, right? Yeah, but it wasn't the bottom. I knew at the bottom. I started at the bottom when I was at RCA Records. Okay. All right. I, I don't even really talk about the RCA Records. Um, it, it, it kind of reminds me of just recently watching uh, the Michael Jordan and, and the Bulls. Uh, they have that documentary, yep. mm -hmm. um, The Last Dance. So, and when Michael got cut and his mom, his mom told him, you know, get out there and just go harder right. and get better and stuff. Something like that kind of happened with me with, with the workplace. After I left Seton Hall University, you know, I was all excited to get into the business. I was I was determined to get into the business. But my mom told me that she had a gig available for me over at, at RCA, all right, long before Def Jam. And, and was your I mom was still there at RCA? Yeah, my okay. mom was working at RCA Records okay. at the time, and, she, you know, she had the hookup. She had the hookup. But my mom was trying to instill in me that, you know, there's no handouts. You still have to, you know, go about it the right way. And this job was in the mail room, okay? And when I say it was deep in the mail room, it was <laughs> deep in the mail room, and I'm delivering mail to people who I knew music more than they did. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it got so frustrating because the supervisor in the mail room, he was trying to, like, kind of belittle me. But I didn't even realize he was trying to inspire me, too. And later on, when I did move up in the ranks at Def Jam, this same dude called me trying to get a job. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it was like a different type of world, but it reminded me somewhat of how Michael, it, it, he didn't cut it out that first right. time. Mm -hmm. But, you know, having mom there to inspire him and then do this, that, and the other, that kind of happened to me. But... Even when I got the job at Def Jam, it wasn't like I had to be like an intern or anything. I was actually assistant to the president, you know, not just an assistant. Right, so right, you're right. what I was able to do was with the assistant, you have to know every aspect of a label. Mm -hmm. I could run a record label from top to bottom because I had to know what all of the de departments were doing from legal counsel to artist development and a and and this, that, and the other, okay? So, with that being said, here I am. You know what I mean? I was never going to be the guy at Def Jam just to be there to get the check, right. as you can see. Yes, I can see mm -hmm. that. <laughs> so that inspiration, that motivation, that drive came from your mom and your grandmother showing you that you could do it. And my it. dad. And your dad. Most definitely. My yeah. brothers. I mean, brother. in my village of Roselle and Linden. Like, where I come from, it's really a trip because I was raised in a barbershop next to a bar. OK, so the little mm -hmm. kid next to the bar by the barbershop, you know, he knows everybody. And then like we have neighboring towns and my grandfather had a laundromat in the neighboring town next to a bar. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. So I was around getting a whole lot of knowledge from a whole lot of people. You know, there was a, a guy in the neighborhood, we called him Monkey Dunk, right? And a lot of people used to like run from Monkey Dunk. But Monkey Dunk and I actually used to have conversations because I used to be on, on the Ave right there, you know, and so many, I got memories for days and I just always knew that you you have to treat the janitor in the CEO the same way. You know what I mean? You mm-hmm. could walk with kings and queens, but don't lose the common touch. And that, that's been embedded in me since I was a little kid. Yeah, no, yeah. and that's so true because you never know who who's going to go where, like who's who, you know what I mean? I think it's so important yeah. to treat everybody mm-hmm. as equals. Yeah. So, so now you're 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 big in the comedy space. You've got Def Jam. I met you at ABFF at Comedy Wings. You've right. got all these other um, things happening. How do you how did you decide like comedy was your thing? How did you decide that was your passion over music? <laughs> comedy is not my passion. It's not your it's passion. Just something, <laughs> it's something that I do well. <laughs> music and sports is my passion. Got it. Okay. <laughs> Anybody will tell you that. KG from Naughty by Nature, we was talking the other day about we need to get a podcast because as much as we do in entertainment, we talk sports more than we talk <laughs> music and comedy. <laughs> I'm That's so you. funny. Yeah. I would have never guessed. I mean, I can. I know you love sports, but I would have never guessed like you wouldn't put comedy as a passion. No, I just been around it for so long. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I just and nobody was really doing anything with with the being innovative with it. You know, back in the day, even you know um, Terry Hodges, comedian uh, who I who I adore, kid from um, from Michigan who I met up in Harlem. He was like a staple at the Apollo Theater, and we worked in the early late eighties together. And he recall he tells everybody that I was the first DJ at a comedy show. <laughs> you know, real talk. I mean, mm-hmm. I was working, you know, in the business. I had records galore. And when I started doing the comedy shows, I started DJing. And that's why Kid Capri became what Kid Capri has become. Because it was important to me to have that element involved. Yep. So when you're watching comedy, though, how do you, how do you know they're the one? Like, how do you know a comedian, a comic has what it takes? I don't know. I don't know. I really don't know. It just, when I go to a comedy show, it just has to hit me because I've seen it all. And I've seen it all for a very long time, you know? And um, I sit back and just, just let it all flow. I stay in my lane big time. I don't trip off of none of this. You know, a lot of people get props in this business and I'd be like, wow. You know, <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be saying to myself, wow, if they only knew the real story. A lot of times, but I don't say anything. I just stay where I do. I let my actions speak. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, but you've done. I mean, you've done a lot for a lot of comedians. Um, you've you've definitely you've definitely set up a platform for comedians to kind of um, take the next step in their careers. So you you kind of you kind of see something in the comics when you're when you're when you're putting that platform together, right? Yeah, but the crazy part about that for me, seriously. And I could, I could like really write the names down and if we ever do this again, well, I wouldn't really say the names too much, but I see comedians sometimes five, 10 years before they hit. And that'd be bugged out because it'd be a lot of in between, you know? And that's why I always say back when we used to do Def Comedy Jam on Friday night, I knew that on Monday, Tuesday, all of the casting directors would be calling me to see who this new talent was. And the trip is, I still can identify who that big name is, but people are so star-driven now without realizing that most of those stars started with me back at the, the Peppermint, you know, little place I had in Jersey, Club 88, mm-hmm. or they were at the Uptown Comedy in Harlem. Like, all of these comedians who are big now they started somewhere else. Trust me right. when I tell you that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, we all start somewhere, right? Yeah, but it's about remembering where you come from a lot of times. Yeah. <laughs> or the next, like right now, and I've mm-hmm. been talking about it a lot, but the playing field after all of this is over, it's survival of the fittest in terms of stand-up comedy. It's like an even Steven playing field, at least with me it is. Like, cause if you haven't sat back and, and, and wrote some material, 
you're going to have to take a, a back seat because people want to hear some fresh stuff right now. And it's been a lot of stuff to look back and go, wow, that was kind of fun. You know, <laughs> I mean, everybody walking around drinking Lysol now, you know, it's crazy, <laughs> right? <laughs> so you think you think when people come back to comedy shows, they still would want to hear about about this pandemic and what we've gone through? Well, it's not about the pandemic per se, but the things that has happened mm -hmm. with the pandemic. You know, I mean, I could, I could, I could think of a bunch of material just off the top of my head in terms of the topics. You know, but it's like, how do you make it happen? You right. know, because I mean, right now, think about, I mean, just real quick, think about what the side chicks have had to go and go through. You know what I'm saying? You know, it's going to be some jokes about that. All of the I, the Instagram live DJs, everybody upset because D Nice getting all the shine. You know, he earned that job. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's, it's some stuff going on right now. Think about it, right? Yeah. Just that quick. Do you think comedy clubs are, are going to be what they used to be? Um, I like to think that they are at some point. But if you look at what's going on, and, and let's be straight up, don't you feel like they moving with this a little bit faster than they was acting like it was? Like all of a sudden they're opening things back up again. I don't think it's time for that yet. Oh no. Mm -hmm. I mean, but they, but the economy, <laughs> this is where the money, you know, where they talk about health is wealth. They're not acting like health is wealth right now. They trying to get wealth. Mm -hmm. That's just my take on it. You know, um, eventually, like it's gonna come back, but still, the the beauty of comedy though is you can actually think about this, and I, I know you know this. You ever go to a comedy club and you have to ask the people to come move up? Everybody yeah. thinks they're supposed to sit back there. Now you're cool with them sitting back there, <laughs> <laughs> right? Right. Yeah. You just gotta spread it out like the six. You know, like every four seats or whatever, you'll be able to get that off with comedy more so with anything else. So in terms of the business that I'm into, there's definitely going to be a way to make it happen. But the thing with me, and we talked about it before, is the way I identify who the comedians are and what they're saying. I don't care. I don't care about their credits because half of them, their credits came from shit I I put them on. Think about it. Real talk. <laughs> yeah. You know? So, there you have yeah. I feel like for me, comedy shows are going to be different because, I mean, as a consumer, I, I don't have a job right now. I have no income coming in, so I can't even, if they were to open a comedy club tomorrow, I can't even go because I don't have money to go. <laughs> that's like, I, that's how I think it's going to happen for a lot of people. Just do they have discretionary money to go to a show or to a movie or to a restaurant? Well, I know one thing with the comedian even. When they do start making money again, the comedian, they're going to need to put some money aside as opposed to going straight to Foot Locker. <laughs> I know that's going to be so hard. <laughs> yeah, because they want to look nice on stage. I understand that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, baby need diapers. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So, yeah. So what's next on your journey? Next on my journey is um, hoping to get a third season of Laugh Mobs Laugh Tracks somewhere on some network. You know what I'm saying? Which I think I will. Uh, the beauty of Laugh Mobs Laugh Tracks is a lot of people have been more people have been watching the show now that they've been home, you know, on YouTube yep. than mm -hmm. on TV. You know what I mean? Because we've been buried under uh, right. impractical jokers. You know, it's crazy. So that's one thing. And, you know, Kid Capri and I, we're working on a hot new project. And I have, uh, I'm taking Laugh Mob live. I'm doing live shows. Once this thing do come back, um, I'm starting with the City Winery in Philadelphia. And we're going to try to keep, I'm just going to try to keep comedy doing what we do. Of course, I had to shut down the Apollo so we have to pick that back up and I have to honor all of the comedians. Like all of the comedians that's been working for me, these gigs has just been postponements. 
not mm -hmm. cancellations, you know. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, some of the comedians that I wanted to use for the 2021 seasons have to take, you know, move back a little bit because I have to take care of these other folks, you know. Right. But it's all good. I got some things going on. <laughs> Can't tell you everything. That's okay. That's okay. I, I'm more, I'm more in, in, intrigued by like the, you just seem to be in such good spirits. Like you don't, you don't seem to feel like this is as a small business owner and somebody whose mm. income has obviously been impacted by this. I'm, I'm, I'm motivated by your, your positivity. Well, well, sense. let me just say this to you. Um, also the ABFF, we had to move that back. You know, we, right, we October, had to move yep. that from June to now October, but more than anything is, I do understand who my Lord and Savior is and what this is really all about. And, you know, even in my documentary, you'll see a whole part of when I was carjacked back in 05. So mm -hmm. my life, I look at life a lot different than most people. You know, this little dent on my head right here didn't just, I didn't just design that. You know, and it reminds me of who I am and what I'm all about. And I'm all about my people. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? I'm all about my people. So I, I say all that to say that we're going to, we got to keep striving and we just got to keep doing for my grandmom and people who have laid it down for me. And when I tell you this, and this might trip you out, but since MLK weekend, when I was down with Alonzo Mourning and everybody at his foundation event, since MLK weekend and through this uh, coronavirus and all this, I had to write down because I didn't want to, because at some point I have to reach out to the family of, of people who I know passed away, friends and family. I've lost 30 people. Wow. From coronavirus? And other things related. But mm -hmm. I have it written down, the names, and they're just grown. So, like, I can't just, like, stop. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and that's what's really happening with me. And that's why, and I know that if it, no one else is prepared for the, 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 uh, the reboot, okay? You know, this is like pressing, you know, the restart. I'm going to be ready. And I know with my business of comedy and even what I do with jazz and jokes, I'm getting ready to do the quarantine sessions on Zoom soon. I'm getting ready to do some entertainment. I've just been sitting back watching everybody else, but I'm getting ready to do that. And I'm getting ready to do something similar to what, what we're doing right here. You know, um, mm -hmm. a little interview, a little something. I'm just want to, I want to create. I want to just create, yeah. you know, and have fun. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't so mean what for you to be you seeing me here like this, but, you know, <laughs> we here. Works for me. So what advice do you have for creatives on their journey? Keep creating. Just keep keep stabbing at it. And, 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 and um, for comedians, keep writing, especially now, you know. But even when I look at, like, how Laugh Tracks got on television and things like that, Take advantage of social media. Take advantage of putting something together, whether it's three minutes, 15 minutes. Look at Issa, Insecure. Yeah. I mean, all of that has happened right on social media. And these are things that we didn't have back in the day. When I was coming up in this business, you know, it was on the grind. And that's why I got to continue to be on the grind. You know, but that's mm -hmm. what it is. It's all about believing in what you want to do straight up mm -hmm. yeah how is it how as a creative do you do you kind of navigate like the challenges that come our way sometimes especially as a creative of color how do you how do you kind of circumvent those obstacles you just got to be prepared for it you got to know i mean the beauty for me is i was involved in a lot of things when i was an undergrad at seton hall university you know even though it wasn't on the level of where i'm at now it was the same type of things that was going on. You know, and you always, you gotta watch your people around you. Cause there's a lot, there's some people that I give it up to who's never turned their back on me and have supported me. Then I've lost contact with some people. And then there's other people who was just there for them. 
You know what I'm saying? And it's always going to be those type of people. This is the point I'm making. Mm -hmm. But you just got to know how to separate it. And you also have to know how to turn. And you ask me, how do I stay so positive? You got to turn things like this into positive thinking. Straight up. Mm -hmm. You know? Keep the faith. That's the main thing. Trust me. I didn't know. Before 05, I had heard about Jesus. Right? But after 05, I actually found out who he really is and I have not let him leave me and I have not left him and I'm not the holiest person in the world you know what I mean but at the same time I know what time it is Mm -hmm. yeah is 05 when the car yeah December 14th 05 12 degrees trust me I'll never forget it never forget I wouldn't either I I I heard about it so I I I'm glad you're okay. You'll see you, in the documentary. We'll get we'll get deep <laughs> with it because it's it's important to. I like to edutain. You know, um, KRS One years and years ago he came up with edutainment, and that's really what it is. You can entertain and educate at the same time. You know, mm-hmm. um, I was really looking forward to um, my high school's graduation this year because they had asked me to speak at the graduation. Oh, awesome. And I, um, you know, that's not going to happen this year. So now I have a whole nother year to see the work, you know, see what happens. And hopefully mm-hmm. I'll have that opportunity to speak to me because that's all it would be is me speaking to me because I was one of those kids, you know what I mean? And right. I've seen some of my friends take the high road and some should have if they were to listen to the same person I was listening to. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So we'll see what's up with that. Well, wishing you the best. So we'll just jump, we'll jump right into the lightning round. The lightning round, I'm going to ask you six questions, rapid fire, and you just tell me the first thing that comes to mind. All right. Uh, <laughs> what's the best advice you've ever received? The best advice that I ever received was from my dad, all right? This is something that I'd never forget because my dad and I used to eat lunch together every day when I was in high school, right? So one day I was like rushing to get back to school because I was about to beat somebody up. (laughs) I mean, that's how it was because they, they didn't understand that, you know, I'm a nice guy, but don't provoke me. You know what I'm saying? Straight up. And this particular day, I was hearing that this guy wanted to fight because I was younger than him, and my friend had had a fight with him and had beat him, right? So I guess now he want to get his card back, so he going to go after the, the younger guy, and it didn't work. But I ended up being the one that had to, you know, take the fall, you know, in terms of a lot of stuff. And my dad explained to me that at the end of the day, I can't let other people provoke me into doing things. You know, I have to be a better judge at what's happening because I might take the fall. You know what I mean? And a lot of those same people who are, you know, doing this, you know, years from now, you might not even see these people. So why risk, you know, this, that, and the other? So that's really what it was about. It was about be your own man. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I like it. What's what's your definition of success? My definition of success is happiness. Happiness with whatever it is that you're doing because there's different levels of success. People look at me and they say, they see I'm successful, but they don't see the material things. And I'm not about the material things. That's not what success does for me. Success does for me when I see that I could take you from the outhouse to the penthouse. And I've done that quite a few times. You know what I'm saying? I'm a behind the scenes guy, but I'm not a behind the scenes guy. So, yeah. That's the beauty of it. What's one thing you wish you knew before embarking on your creative journey? Before embarking on my 
creative journey. Yeah, before starting. I'm sorry? Yeah, before you started your creative journey, before you got into all of this, like what's one thing you wish you knew about this journey? If there's something that I wish I knew about this journey is probably, it's hard to say because the journey has been so peaks and valleys and all of that. And I think that it's important to have those, you know, um, I, I, I probably would say know who to do your business with, you know, at the end of the day, because I've wasted more money than you can imagine on people that, mm -hmm. wow, I wish I knew better. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But um, that's not even, you know, you got my mind racing right now with that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who, in who inspires you and why? Who inspires me and why? I think I, I think I pretty much answered that question earlier. You, you know? have. Yep. You said your mom, your grandmother, yeah. and your dad. Yeah, that's really so that's really them. who inspired me. My family in general. Okay. You know, they inspire mm -hmm. me because you know it's like you, you could pick your friends, but you can't pick your family. So when you have your mm -hmm. family behind you, that's a beautiful thing. And I have a very large family on my mother and father's side, you know. And then, you know, I'm inspired by my Lord and Savior. Like I said, there was mm -hmm. a time when I didn't know who he was, you know. And now mm -hmm. knowing every morning when I wake up, every night when I go to sleep, I'm feeling good. And that's why even on, on, on I used to be a DJ. And I don't, you know, I don't be messing with the equipment and stuff like I used to, but I play music. I play music all day on Facebook, and it's a trip because I, I have people that really, they tell me, like, it, it does something for them. And I, I feel good about that. So, you know, stuff like that inspires me. <laughs> What's a habit that's helped you on your journey? A habit? Yep. Now that, you know, now that weed is legalized, um, <laughs> you know, I ain't even, <laughs> let me tell you something. It helped me get through Seton Hall. No, let me stop. Um, <laughs> um, what was that question? I forgot. I <laughs> you smoke too much weed. That's no, what well, happened. I mean, what was the question? <laughs> What's a habit that's helped you on your journey? A habit that, that that's helped me is, is just mm -hmm. staying, staying me. Just stay in me, you know, yeah. just stay in me. Cause you know, there's sometimes people be hitting me talking about Bob. I didn't know that somebody told me that you had a nice jump shot. You know, somebody told me you was a DJ. Somebody <laughs> told me you this, that, and the other. And I'm like, you know, it's not about that. It's about letting it just, it just happen. That's why I have to do this documentary because again, I want to edutain folks, you know? And it's important mm -hmm. to know that all those people you see, they come from somewhere. And I know where they come from, you know. Yep. Yeah. It's gonna be a cool documentary. Do you have a Do you have a live nah, date? I mean, or right now it's really a trip because of what has happened. You know, everything has right. really this whole pandemic has really put a. Uh, we got to relaunch. We really do. So, we'll figure it out. I ain't in no rush. I'm here. <laughs> last, <laughs> last question. What do you want your legacy to be? My legacy? Wow. I mean, for me, when, when people ask me if there's something that I really want to do, I would really, really at some point, like Barry Gordy and John Johnson from Ebony J, they pretty much laid the blueprint on what I really want to do. And I want to be able to employ my friends and family in one building where it's all things that involves entertainment that I, you know, the entertainment that I like. And um, that's what I want to do. I want to um, be able to just have a, have a situation where 
people are like what they went to school for their expertise or what they went to trade school for they're all in my building doing what they want to do and getting a check that's really what I want to do that's what I want to do I'm going to do I see that happening you are going to do it put yeah. in the universe speak it out I think you I think you have it in you yeah yeah no thank you I just one last question to wrap up Oh, Bob, if our listeners wanted to find you online, where could they find you? Where could they find me? And you can point the... Oh, if, if the <laughs> listeners want to um, find me online, actually, I have an all-comedy page on Facebook, Bob Sumner's Comedy Spot. Yeah, and that's everything okay. comedy. That's where I do, you know, a lot of my, my stuff. And then um, on Instagram, I'm Bob.Sumner. And on Twitter, same thing. Okay. <laughs> and if they wanted to catch your latest work? Well, right now, my latest work is on hold. <laughs> my latest work is on hold, but, I mean, they could always go online and look up Laugh Mobs, Laugh Tracks, Laugh Mobs, We Got Next. You know, we have Deaf Comedy Jam clips that's running on Kevin Hart's LOL network right now. And, you know, we'll be coming back to the Apollo Theater and to the city winery. You know, I have quite a few things that's, that's happening. It's just a matter of when is everything going to be rebooted, you know? Yep. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm glad that we were able to make this happen. Thank You're you welcome. so much. Wasn't I right? Didn't Bob just drop so much knowledge on you guys? So many gems in that interview. So much to take away and to really just think about and see how can you incorporate into your daily lives. Here are my key takeaways. One, your purpose doesn't have to be your passion. Two, surround yourself with people who inspire you. Three, don't be the guy just trying to get the check. Four, COVID is just a restart. Get ready and be ready. And five, always be creating. Thank you guys so much again for tuning into this episode. Part two is going to drop in two weeks. Until then, join the Facebook group. Check out the website, funnybrowngirl.com. Sign up for the email list. Take the quiz. Again, the Facebook group is called Creative Breakthrough Community. Check it out. Get on the list for resources and opportunities. Keep elevating your creative journey. Keep working at it. Keep writing. Keep creating. And what are you waiting for? Get out there. Go flex your creative muscle and keep winning.